coming up on Shawele Road. Hello there, brother and sister. My name is Dixon Wasake. I'm a born servant of Jesus the Christ. So towards the end of 2021, the Lord Jesus actually told me to prepare a series of 12 messages called Catch the Revival. He was actually showing me that revival is here, but we need to have the eyes of faith so we can catch it. So today's message is actually part six in this eye-opening series. And the Lord actually has told me to share with you that he wants us to learn from past history, the messes and the blessings that come with revival in order to prepare us as we catch our own revival. Now, revival is actually a great thing because it brings with it the Lord's power, miracles, healing, preaching, salvation, and other blessings. However, or but, most people actually who have heard of a Christian revival consider it to be messy, controversial business. In fact, it disrupts normal life. Then also during revival, actually, people get certain physical manifestations, for example, jacks this is like violent shaking others fall down and they call this being slain in the spirit then you have speaking in tongues some people even bark some dance some shout some cry some tremble all of these things here make some people actually hate this kind of stuff but what about you if the lord of Hosts actually visited your body, which is like a clay jar. Would you tremble when the Lord visits? How would this affect you? How would you think of others having experienced this? So my Lord Jesus who sends me actually wants me to tell you about the history of controversy so that we can be prepared for when he comes. So come along to hear some more. So, who am I and how did the Lord actually entrust me with this message when I was formerly untrustworthy? So I actually experienced a personal revival in 2017 and I got baptized after I encountered the Lord Jesus. How this happened is that I spent about two to three months reading the Word of God and eventually it entered my heart. Eventually I confessed that Jesus is Lord. Now, if you knew me, you'd have known that this didn't come easy because I was pretty wild. I was consumed by money. I was actually consumed by career progression and I was pretty sexually promiscuous. I drank a lot of alcohol, but the Lord Jesus eventually came and he washed me clean. After I continued sitting at his feet, learning from him every day, he eventually commissioned me as a preacher of righteousness and for a number of years he's been giving me his words or his oracles and that is how he commissioned me to go ahead of him to prepare the way in this season of catch the revival so in this message that the lord wants me to unveil we're going to learn from history a very exciting story that is going to come we're going to learn from history we as a universal church we need to prepare for when outsiders actually start scrutinizing our work, investigating our finances, miraculous claims. These are things we need to prepare for. Then we also need to prepare ourselves for the tensions, the disputes which can come with revival. And we need to put in place certain things in advance to handle this so that we can grow instead of falling apart. Today's message, by the way, is just a drop in the ocean of what the Lord has been unveiling for me. And if your heart is already being moved by what I am saying and this is something you've been excited about, then visit our Revival page and there you can find detailed notes that are used to prepare this message. And now, let's dive into this. So we're going to learn from the Bible about revivals and the controversy that comes with them. So to start you off, 
There's a very interesting passage in the Bible, in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verse 28, and this is what it says. When the men heard this, they were enraged and began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So if you read this verse, it has actually placed earth in the middle of chaos. You can see angry men and they're shouting. And the question is, why are they yelling, great is Artemis of the Ephesians? So first a background about Artemis and then about the Ephesians to give you context. So Artemis was actually a Greek goddess or rather is a Greek goddess and she was apparently the daughter of their chief god called Zeus and she was in charge of a number of things like the hunt, childbirth, virginity and sudden death. So Artemis was so popular that she was worshipped and there was a great temple in the city of Ephesus in her honor. In fact, this temple of Artemis was actually one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So now about Ephesus, the people of Ephesus were called Ephesians. Now it is actually a, a city that was, would have been in present day Turkey, in a region which was called Asia Minor, and it was part of the Roman Empire at the time. It was actually also a very famous city. In fact, around the time of 1 BC, this would have been the time of Jesus and thereabouts, it had a population of 250,000, but at that time, it was the second largest city in the world, second after Rome. So therefore, Ephesus of the Ephesians was actually an important city, perhaps like one of our largest cities today, maybe New Delhi, maybe Shanghai, maybe Rio de Janeiro, maybe Buenos Aires, perhaps like Toronto or Chicago in North America, or maybe like Lagos and Dar es Salaam in Africa. So what we have in this story, we have the equivalent of people in a great city like Lagos or Toronto, as I have said, and they're shouting, a mob of angry people. Now the question is, something has disturbed the peace of this great city. And this something has to do with their great goddess, Artemis. What could cause this kind of disruption? The answer is revival. A revival had caused these people to get so angry, which is strange because we are going to see what revival does, but it caused people to get so angry. And therefore now, I am going to give you the before and the after, which brings us to this great climax. And this story, if you're following along, is in the book of Acts, very interesting. And the main character is called Paul. And now let's dive into excerpts of this story to see how the drama unfolds. So part one is the beginning of the revival. In verses one to five, I'm gonna read extracts as necessary from the Bible. We're gonna see what happens. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the interior and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? No, they answered. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. They were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. So the first thing we can see is that revival in Ephesus began like a little small seed when the Holy Spirit came on these 12 men. Now revival usually starts with the Holy Spirit. In fact, without the Holy Spirit, revival cannot take place. And the activity of the Spirit is very prominent in revival, like the day of Pentecost. Now, because revivals look like Pentecost, this is why there are a lot of physical manifestations, the jerks, the shouting, the slain in the spirit, as I highlighted. Now, some of these phenomena are actually prompted by God because we are like jars of clay holding a great treasure. When the great I am visits our bodies, human bodies that are fallen with sin, some of them cannot handle him. Hence why some people bark, shout, shaking, trembling, screaming, crying. So now we're going to move on to part two, revival starting to spread. Let's read on. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months. 
arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched his skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. So we can see a shift. Paul preaches for three months in a synagogue, which would be the equivalent of our modern churches, but he is rejected. He's abused by the religious leaders. So instead, he starts holding discussions in a lecture hall. This would be the equivalent of maybe a school hall or a public theater. It's a result of this that this entire great city of Ephesus and its surrounding areas eventually hear the gospel. Modern scholars say because he taught some of his students, these students went out and they were spreading the gospel. However, it did take time, about two years, to happen. Therefore, revival requires constant labor. It is not instant. The other thing we can see is the revival actually bore fruit. And God approved the work of Paul. And that is when miracles start happening. Unusual miracles. And these miracles cause deliverance. Even handkerchiefs. Can you imagine? An important point at this stage is to note that. Do you realize that revivals come, but the religious leaders often reject what is happening. And this is not an unusual pattern. So saint, you have to be aware of this. If you're in a church that is experiencing revival, if your leader is leading you in good revival, he is likely to get rejected and your church is likely to be rejected by other denominations. But that shouldn't surprise you. Our Lord Jesus was killed because the religious leaders of his day were jealous of him. The apostles at this time were persecuted as well because of jealousy. So you can expect jealousy to happen in a revival. Next, part three of what is going to happen is now this. Imitators come onto the scene, and yet God gets the glory. Let's read on. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town, casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus, to Jews and Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at a public bonfire. The value of the books was several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. Now, as I was reading it, I actually burst out laughing because the Lord, the Lord has sense of humor. I mean, we read this in the Bible. Imagine people running away naked. Anyway, I really chuckled in case you, you figure that out. But anyway, back to serious business. The revival is actually getting hot. The common magicians are starting to recognize, even the common people, that the name of Jesus is not one you play around with. And in fact, it is starting to be separated from all the other names. Therefore, do not mess around with the name Jesus, but I'll come to that. The second thing we actually see is that the revival is now starting to impact the economics of the city. People who used to buy magic books supporting magicians are realizing that Jesus' name is greater, and now tension, you can see, is going to start coming. It's going to build because Paul is causing millions of dollars to be lost in business. Therefore, the lesson is this, first of all, in revival, 
non-Christians start realizing that Jesus' name is above all names and that is how many end up coming to Christ because they see the power of his name and it is no wonder we need revival because in our world today we think Jesus his name is just like any other name Muhammad Buddha Krishna but no the Lord Jesus his name is above all other names and that is why we are saying Lord Jesus come Maranatha 